Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. I have Bill here, Mr. Donnell Kearney. We're going to call him Dink because he said call him Dink. And if somebody says to call me, call him Dink, well, I guess I'm going to call him Dink. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we got to know each other a little bit earlier, and um, I just want everybody to get to know you. So you tell me about you. What's going on, Cal? First of all, thanks for having me on the show, man. I really appreciate it. Um, that's, that's not a whole lot to know about me, man, but just a little bit to know about me. Um, well, first of all, I'm 48 years old. I'm a veteran. Um, I'm married. Um, have six children, ages um, 27, 25, 21, 19, 17, and 8. The first four boys, last two are girls. Um, I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. I live in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I work for the federal government, but I'm a stand-up comedian also. Um, I'm an author, and um, I'm an actor also. And I um, love doing stand-up. Um, I have a comedy special called Ghetto Rachi. It rhymes with Liberace, but it's spelled Ghetto Rachi, G-H-E-T-T-O. R A U C H I. Got a Rachi that's on Amazon Prime and it's gonna be heard on Pandora. And um, I'm also the, the host of the Liquor House Comedy Show. And that too can be seen on Amazon Prime and Tubi TV, YouTube, Pandora, seen, seen and heard on Pandora. And also it can be seen and heard in over 160 English speaking countries. Wow. And my stage, yeah, my stage name is um, Ghetto Rachi. I wear a robe on the stage and I like to cut up. So, a black man with a microphone on the robe on the stage, you know you're about to have a good show. <laughs> well, let me start off saying thank you for your service. Appreciate it. Thank you. And 82nd Airborne Division, too. 82nd Airborne Division. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, jumped out of airplanes. I jumped out of perfectly moving airplanes. So now I'm doing stand-ups. I'll let you know I'm not, you know, the elevator might not go all the way to the top. <laughs> well, I understand you like being, uh, you like, uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, apparently, you don't mind being tortured because you got six kids. I mean, I thought I was bad having five, but you beat me. Oh yeah, I, I, yeah, the torture. That's the understatement. I don't. It's another word for that. I don't even think it's called torture anymore. It's something below torture. It's even worse. How about broke? <laughs> Amen to that, brother. Yeah, mine go from I think twenty-eight. I got a 28 year old, and then we got one that's about to turn 25. One's about two of them that's about to turn 24, and then the baby's 21. Okay, that's cool. So you didn't have a you didn't have a late one like I did. You didn't wait till you was 40 to have another one. A surprise one. That's what my wife and I did. We had a we had a surprise one. So no, I I figured I was tortured enough. I didn't need to you know put yeah. myself through any. You know, I, I'd still like to enjoy retirement. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're right about that. <laughs> you're you're a glutton for punishment. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and speaking of being tortured, um, just to let everybody know, I found out that me and Dink here are both Cowboys fans, so we like being tortured. Yeah, we like being in abusive relationships for <laughs> for over 40 years. So, you know, we, we love it. It's something about it. We just keep going back. We can't turn away. It's just, I don't care how many times they lose, we just, when they cheat on us, we just stay with them, you know. So, um, it's a bad relationship to be in, man. Yeah, you find out that um, it's kind of like being married after, what, 40-some-odd years. You you have maybe five good ones. Yeah, five, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, about four. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, about five good ones, yeah. You're right. I'm just kidding, yeah, honey. I love ones. you. Yeah. Yeah, about five. Yeah, yeah mine, mine heard it. Trust me, I hear about it later. <laughs> Well, we can we can both uh, talk later on when we're both sleeping on the couch, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Texting each other. Hey, man. <laughs> you still on the couch, man? Yeah, I'm still on the couch. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's, so, how, that's, that's how they do us, man. Yeah, that's, that's how they do us. So what else you like doing, man? Um, I love to, um, I love to read and write. Um, I, I, I love doing it. I love to write. And that's, that's how I came up with my, my book. Um, the sparrow will fly. Um, um, I was, I just love to write. And, um, you know, one day I was in church and there was this little kid, um, he had his head shaven and, um, you know, you never hate, you hate to assume stuff. So I said, wow, I said, that little kid, he might be sick, you know, because he was frail and had a bald head, but he was in church and he was enjoying himself. He was just full of praise. He couldn't have been no more than 10 years old. Well, make a long story short, I, um, I'm seeing this kid. And then the song, the choir sings this song called um, The Sparrow Will Fly by uh, Mahala Jackson. And the kid, he was singing the song and he was just in this high spirit. So I took my pen out and I wrote The Sparrow Will Fly. And I kept looking at that kid and I said something about that kid. So later on after church, I come to find out from somebody else that kid had cancer. Mm -hmm. So I go back home that day and I said, I'm gonna write a story about that kid. And the name of the, the, the title was The Sparrow Will Fly. And the story is about a young kid who has cancer. He's a big basketball uh, fan whose favorite team is North Carolina State University, the Wolfpack. He's a high school All-American, and in his senior year, he gets a scholarship to play basketball at North Carolina State University, but he finds out he has cancer, mm -hmm. and his whole world comes crashing down. So he goes through this despair while he's going through cancer, and then one day he meets this young kid named Jericho who has cancer. But Jericho's attitude about cancer is totally different than, than Paul Christian, the basketball player. Mm -hmm. In fact, Jericho's personality is just like the young boy I saw at church that day who had cancer but was full of praise. And the two formed this great relationship that would change Paul Christian, the main character's life forever. And that's the gist of the story. It's called The Sparrow Will Fly. It's a heart warm, heartfelt story um, about dealing with the ups and downs of life, dealing with the imperils of life and how you can overcome things. Um, and a lot of people have read it. A lot of people like the book. Um, I've, I've had a lot of publishing companies come to me to want to take the book and um, do all these other things with it. Um, but that's the gist of the book. It's a, it's a very inspirational book. Um, it's going, I'm getting it republished. It should be coming out again either this month or next month. And I would love for so many people to read when it comes out to read this book. Um, it's a very heart, heart, um, heartfelt story, but it's very motivating, very inspiring. It's encouraging. It's, I just think it's a good read. And I, and I, I just want people to, to, to buy the book, to read the book, not so I can get money, but so they can get the message that's in that book. Yeah. And um, it's, it's, it just goes back to me loving to write. And I wanted to write something that was encouraging about cancer because everything about cancer is always negative. Although cancer sucks, it's not about having cancer. It's, it's about a person overtaking cancer itself. And um, I just, I just want people to, to read the book and, and, and just get the, the great message that's in the book. Yeah, and it's called it's, The Sparrow Will Fly. It's a, uh, it's very, gosh, I, what's the word I'm trying to find here? I mean, it, it, it hurts when somebody that, that you care about has cancer. And, yes. But to, to have that different attitude, I mean, you look at, well, let's just take most recently you had Chadwick Boseman. You would have never thought that guy had cancer because he was so dedicated to his work and, and he still was there every day doing what he did. And then, of course, yesterday um, we lost uh, Eddie Van Halen. 
And, yes, we do. And, um, you know, I knew he had cancer, but I thought he had beat it just because yeah. the guy never slowed down. And it, yeah. it's so easy just to give up when you find out yeah. you have cancer. But, you know, right. anybody that's going it, through that needs to read this book then. Yeah, it's, it's going to be coming out on um, The Sparrow Will Fly. And uh, that's that's the that's the gist of that book. Like you said, you know, it's, it affects so many people, but it's how you handle it. And um, Jerry Cole Walls, who's the other character in the book, is – was the reason why Paul Christian was able to um, learn so much because of the cancer. And um, it puts me in the mind of Jimmy Valvano when he said, don't ever give up. And, and that's, that's what that book is about. You don't, you don't ever give up. You don't ever let something take over you, you know, you don't ever let it do it. And then, and, um, and I, when I wrote it, when I wrote the book, um, I had Jimmy V in mind when I wrote it too, because I kept, you know, like I said, I'm a state fan, so I kept thinking about you never give up, you never give up. And I just feel like that book can be applied to so many things in life whenever you're going through a difficult situation. If you're homeless, if you, you're sick, if you lost a job, if you, whatever death is, whatever situation you're in, you don't let that be the cancer and take you out. Right, you right. take that out. And when you change your attitude about it, then that's what you can deal with. It. And that's what Chad with Boltzmann did because nobody knew he had it. Nobody knew he had it. Yeah, when he I... filmed several he filmed he filmed several movies with it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew he had it. That's why when he passed, people were shocked. Like, oh my God. I was I was definitely shocked. Yeah, me too. And see that's that's what that book's about. You know, I don't want to give everything away, but I just think it's a great read. And the, and the one thing I won't accomplish with that book is I won't, I wanted to reach the masses. I'd be the first to say, it ain't about money with me with that book. Would I like if I got some? Of course, but even then, it's not about that. I, but if that thing, that book can reach every young person, anybody that got cancer, I'll be happy. And I told the, the publisher of the book, I'm not going to stop until that book reaches the potential it's supposed to. Because I have another book I'm going to have coming out, but I'm not going to put that one out until this one does what it's supposed to do. And when it does that, then now I release another one. But that book has to reach the people it's supposed to reach, especially young kids that got cancer. You know, and I've been, you know, I had to get it republished because. The first company, they, they, they went out of business. So that meant my book was no longer on a major platform. So yeah. I had to go through another company. So I'm actually, I'm actually using two companies right now. And like I told both publishers, I said, this has to reach the masses. Um, I'm, I, and I, there's so many things I want to do to get it back out there. I, I don't know the right people to get it out in front of because it's just a great read. And, and I want to see it in libraries. I want to see it in bookstores. I just wanted to get to the people need to get to. And when that happens, I will be happy. I will be, I will really be happy. And, when, you know, that's why I'm glad to be on your show so I can talk about it because that's, that, that, that you know, I, I lost a brother to cancer hmm. November 30th hmm. would be a year. I lost, I lost, a, yeah. So, you know, watching him deal with that, you know, was, was heart wrenching in itself, you know, and, I watched his fight through it. He never complained. In fact, I have a video of him rapping seven days before he passed away. Him and my other brother, my brother was beatboxing. He was, he was, um, he was rapping. That was on a Sunday, and he passed away that following Saturday, November thirtieth. But his spirit was so magnificent. It was so high up until the day he died. And I said. That's my book right there. That's my brother. That's he he exemplified it. Him and other people. They exemplified it. And although my brother may have died from cancer, or cancer might have been the underlying thing, it didn't kill his spirit. It didn't kill his soul. It didn't take him out of here. He he still was the same person. There was no complaining. There was no crying. You know. 
But then he said, hey, you got a couple of weeks to live. He said, okay. All right. And then nothing changed. So if if my book can do what it's supposed to do, if it can get out there and reach the masses, I would be one of the happiest persons ever. You know, it's, it's not it's not even about, I guess it's not, it's not about the money. It's not about the accolades. It's about getting getting that book in front of the people that it needs to get in front of, especially young kids, because a lot of kids have got cancer. Yeah. A lot of young kids, there's teenagers like, like the main character of the book, Paul Christian, he, he has it. You know, you have a lot of them that's in distraught and despair, but they can, but this can be their Bible. This can be an in addition to their Bible that they already use, and this can be another form of inspiration, so be it. And and that's why, I've, I, you know, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, and I have tried my best to promote it. Well, so when it come back out, I'm going to I'm gonna up the ante and do everything I can in my power to get it out there. But whoever hears this, if they got the power to to take it somewhere that I can't take it, please do it. It's not about me. It's not about me writing the book. It's about the purpose of that book. Because every day, this is, matter of fact, this is, you know, this is cancel month. And I know the people out there that can take it and say, you know what, this is a good book. Let's get it out there to the children's hospital with cancer. Let's get it to um, other people that got cancer, you know. Let's get it to the Council Foundation. Let's let this be something that people can read when they are down, when they are out, when they are suffering, when they're having a bad day because they got cancer. You know, they don't, they can't see the end of the tunnel. So maybe if they can read this book about um, Paul Christian and The Sparrow Will Fly, it could motivate them. It might just be this, the strength they need to get them out of that funk, you know? And if that book can do that, brother, I would be more happier than that if I went to a sold-out comedy show and I made the whole crowd laugh. That book would do volumes. I'd rather that happen than me go to, to make a whole stadium room of people laugh. Because I know everybody deals with cancer in some form or way. And I just know this book can do wonders for people. And like I said, it's not a, it's not about me. It's not about me being an author. It's just about the message that's out there. I just I just want to be the I just wrote the message. I just need somebody to take it to another level. And I and I know I know it's a great book because i the publishers have told me. The publishers have said, Hey, I we we came across your book. They recommended eight point six out of ten. I even when we got off the phone, I would even forward you the email I got from the certain publishing company. Oh wow. But, I just, I just wanted to do what it's supposed to do. Um, um, and you know, me being where I'm at in this position, I can do what I can do on my level, but I know there's people out there that can take it to another place. They can get it in front of the people and say, hey man, this is a good book. Y'all need to purchase it and put it in libraries, put it in hospitals, put it in, the, the, you know, it, it, just, it just, just needs, I just wanted to do what it's supposed to do. Um, put it in Christian bookstores because it has a Christian theme to it. You know, um, I don't want to give away that part of the book, but but it probably one day, eventually, when I'm sitting down talking about, it, I talk about the Christian part of it. But if you read it, they'll understand that it. it's has it has faith based to it at the same time. So, um, it's sports related, but it's also faith based. Well, whenever you do get that out there to to sell again, um, if you could send me the link, I can put that in the description of the of the Absolutely. video and everything. So, um, when people do come across this and they listen then um, the, the have that link there so they can go buy the book. Um, I can always go back and put that in later on. So, <clears throat> And I'll also send you a copy, too. I'm going to send you an autograph copy, too. Oh, that would be awesome. Copy. I love to read. Yeah. 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 Send you an autograph copy, man. Send you, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And in this day and age where it just seems like everything, especially this year, oh, my gosh, this year has been awful. Um one thing after another yes. pandemic and you know rioting and you know everybody hating on each other because they don't support the same candidates and that kind of thing we need right, right. Kind exactly. of light in this darkness we really do we need an inspiration yeah we do man yeah we do i i think that book is a, is a great inspirational book um i'm sure there are others out there too um and i know they are but i i think we need some type of inspiration just like you just said the uh, 2020 is a, it's been a bad year mm. and it is, it is a cancer. So how, how do you get through it? How do people deal with the COVID situation? You know, I lost a, I lost a military friend to COVID back in April. 
48 mm-hmm. years old, like myself, wife, two children. Um, you know, there's other people that's come across COVID. So, you know, it's things like that that we have to deal with on a daily basis. And that's what the, the sparrow will fly is about. You know, your your wings get clipped. Do you do you stay down? Or do you get back up and fly again? True. Uh, the thing is, too, is we cannot let the attitude of you know the the masses or whatever right now change us as individuals. We need to continue being who we are and and not let that mentality hit us where we we're hating. You know, I, I hate getting on to social media because I will see people that have been friends for, you know, 30 years or even family members right, right. <clears throat> and because they don't think the same way. And like I said, they don't support the same candidate or whatever in politics. They they stop being friends or they stop talking. Right. Come on, man. Come on. We need we need to, to keep some positivity going yeah yeah we do and i think sometimes you find positivity in in fiction you find it in you find it in other ways success stories you know sometimes that's where you find it at you find it in things um other places that you didn't think you could find it you know you, you, and and that's what this country has to do they got to go back to you know, whatever the values are of this country, and they po- we supposed to live by them, then we need to go back to that, and we need to find that, and and not let the cancerous things continue to tear us apart. And that's where we are right now in 2020. Yep. And until we do that, we're gonna continue to stay in this cancerous situation. You know, we if we, we claim to be the greatest country on earth, then we have to live by the principles that say we are the greatest country on this earth. You ain't never lying. It's just man. that simple. You ain't never lie. I don't care what I don't care what color you are. I don't care what political affiliation you are with or whatever. You know, you can't say you're great, but you don't do great things. Your behavior don't say that. And until we take that responsibility as a country, we're gonna stay in this situation. And that's everybody. I don't care what your affiliation is. I don't care who you are, how big you are, skinny or short. You know, black, white, whatever. Until this country as a whole, so you know what? We're gonna change this mindset then we're going to continue to be in it. It's right. just that simple. Well, just like simple. I, like I told you before, I'm, I'm not prejudiced because some of my best friends are Houston Texans fans. <laughs> I know you're right. Same with me, man. Some of my best friends are Redskins fans and, you know, I pray for them daily. And, um, but yeah, you're right. Same <laughs> likewise here. <laughs> you got to have faith there, brother. You got to have faith. <laughs> yeah. Got to, got to have faith. <laughs> Yeah, cause they, they, they feel they they feel worse than cowboy fans. And I said, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. So this is this is your shining moment. We'll talk about what you want to talk about. So if you want to talk about sports, we'll talk about sports. If you want to talk about your, anything, you just just say the word. Um, you know, well, there's a lot of things we talk about. Um, I, I can I, I plug in. Like I said, I know I said it before. I plug in the. I do have a comedy special called um, Ghetto Rachi on Amazon Prime. And it can be heard on Pandora. Um, it's doing real good. Um, go check it out. It's, it's explicit, so please do not sit down and watch that with your children, the grandchildren, because they might repeat what I said. So don't do that. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's getting a lot of good reviews. Um, a lot of people like it, so you can listen to that. I actually did that two and a half years ago. Um, but I had so much material. I want to do like an hour. I end up doing like 35 minutes. But anyway, um, I have another one coming out soon. I'm going to be recording. And also, like I said before, I'm the host of the Liquor House Comedy Show. Um, it's a lot of up and coming comedians on that show. Very funny. It's on Amazon Prime, 2B TV. Um, it's on Pandora, Spotify, um, Google Play. Please check it out. It, this, these comedians are hilariously funny. Um, they are just as funny as the famous ones. So if you get the opportunity, people, please, please check it out. It's called Liquor House Comedy. And if you're from the Deep South, you know all about a liquor house. And it's everything a liquor house will have. Funny comedians, like I said, you, you got a black man in the robe who won't want to wear a suit because he didn't want his kids to think he got money. So uh, like I said, just <laughs> just check it out, man. It's, it's really funny. So um, I want to put those plugs in there about that. And um 
also I'm, I'm going to be in this um, movie called Messy. Um, I recorded that this summer. That's a drama. I'm not being a funny man in that. I'm actually being a stick up man. I'm being a um, like a muscle man, you know. So I had to come out of character and play something that I'm not used to doing, you know. Um, that's a different role for me um, playing that. That will be coming out later on this year. That's going to be on Amazon Prime, Tubi TV, Pluto TV, things of that nature. Uh, so uh, I, you know, look out for that. But in the meantime, outside of those things, um, I'm a big sports fan. Like I said, man, um, I like the Los Angeles Lakers. You already know about the Dallas Cowboys. Yes, um, I do. Atlanta Braves. Yeah, the Atlanta Braves. Big Braves fan. Been a Braves fan my entire life. And I love the North Carolina State Wolfpack. So let me say that again to the people out there that only believe there are two teams in the state of North Carolina. Two colleges, rather. There's NC State University that's in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I'm from. There's also Wake Forest University that's in Winston-Salem. I'm saying that to say that Duke University and UNC are not the only two universities in the state of North Carolina, okay? Because whenever I go out of the state of North Carolina, the first thing people ask me, do I like Duke of Carolina? And I want to slap them. I want to <laughs> slap them because they were, not edu- they were not educated on the schools in the state of North Carolina. There's also another school I, I, I happen to graduate from, North Carolina Central University, historically black college. I went there first. Um, for for um, undergrad, then I went to North Carolina State University for grad school. But I just had to say that because so many people believe that there, there are only two colleges in the state of North Carolina, Duke and UNC, and I do not like the Tar Heels. So if you listen to this this podcast, people, I do not like your stinking Tar Heels. I think they are pathetic. I can't stand them. And I'm a hater because they always win and my team don't. So there you go. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're both Cowboys fans. We know how that goes. And, yeah, 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 yeah. In um, Cowboys nations, I'm, I'm, I'm hurting right now. We, we have a bad defense. We have a bad defense, but we do got Dak Prescott. He's playing good, despite the fact he has to carry the team because we have a, a defense that can't stop a nosebleed with twelve hands. So we you know we just. <laughs> yeah. It, it, that defense couldn't stop a. A group of senior citizens, man, that were dead. And they just they just can't do it. They just they just can't do it. But I'll always be a Cowboys fan. Die hard till I die. Yeah, me too. I'm always a Cowboys fan. I love them, man. That's, yeah, they, yeah. They, I, I love them. Um, I just hate that we won in three. We're giving up 146 points um, in the first four games. That's unheard of. That's like the worst in franchise history. Considering that our we first our first year we went 0 and 11, so that lets you know how bad we are. Uh, we're giving up 38 plus points in three straight games. That's never happened since 1960 when we went 0 and 11. So we just we just bad on defense. Yeah, and then my my Texas Longhorns lost this weekend to TCU, and I, y'all, y'all, that hurt my y'all feelings 3, too. Right? No, 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 no. That's we're two and y'all, one. Oh, oh, Oklahoma's the one that's winners. That's right. Oklahoma's winners. Yeah. Who who did y'all lose to again? TCU. Texas Are you Chris and Ewing. Right, that's there's something about that team that we always have fits with, and I don't get it. I don't understand why. Well, it might be that C word, Christian. So maybe that's what it is, you know. <laughs> You know, you got you got God you know, and Christians. <laughs> I, I, I watched the I watched the that um, coach's mouth this weekend. Ain't nothing Christian about what that guy was saying. <laughs> oh, that Christian. <laughs> but, but man, y'all y'all normally dominate t- TCU though. No, uh, actually, in the past, I mean, yeah, we have, but the, for some reason here, the last several years, we've just had fits with them. I don't understand why. Oh wow. It's like that sometimes. It's, it's you know it happens. You know I, I'm rooting for Texas, man. I you know I, I love I love powerhouses. I love to see Texas good, Oklahoma, Auburn, Alabama, USC, Notre Dame. That's what college football is all about. I love to see um, Michigan. I hate to see Ohio State just dominate Michigan. I know it's good for Ohio State fans, but as a casual fan on the outside looking in, I, I like to see. I, don't want to, I like to see dominant teams, but I don't want to see when one team just killing the other one. It takes away the rivalry part, you know. That's like true. Duke and Carolina. 
Duke and Carolina basketball, uh, I think it's probably one of the best, if not the best rivalry in all sports. Um, they are top notch year in and year out. And those games never disappoint. They never blow outs. You know, you might see one sweep one year. They might sweep the other team one year, but that don't happen all the time. There's no – you're not going to see Duke beat UNC 10 straight times. That ain't happening. Or vice versa. It just ain't happening. That's the best things it's about rivalries, man. You don't want Yeah, to. and that's what makes rivalries good. As much as I hate the Eagles and I love when we beat them, part of me like it when it's two gladiators just at the top of the food chain going at it. Yeah. You know, like back in the day with the Redskins and Cowboys, like, yeah, Joe Gibbs on one side, Tom Lange on the other. And it was just a, a good game, year in, year out, start to finish. You might get a blowout every now and again. But not you better that next game, not very awesome. But that next game, it was going to be good. Yes. And you, you just, yeah, that's what makes sports sports, man. You know, I mean, I get a sweep here and there, but – that's what makes rivalries. Even if you hate the other team, you hate to lose to them. That's what makes it a rivalry. Yeah, it's not. You wouldn't even that's call it rivalry, in, uh, yeah. the the Harlem Globetrotters and the Washington Generals. That's not even a, a real rivalry because I think that in the whole time that right. they ever played, the Generals have only won once. Yeah, and that's what and that's what makes it. You know, you don't want to lose to your rivalry, but at the same time, if you're beating them all the time. And it's it's not good. The game's not good. You lose interest. I don't care who you are. Yeah, true. And that's what that's what happened with the NC State UNC basketball rivalry. They have dominated us so much that the new generation of Tar Heel fans don't even see them as a rivalry anymore. No, no, y'all not y'all y'all little brother or something. We like Duke. Duke's our rivalry. And that's what happens. You you even state fans, you know, you like, wow, man, you can't even beat these boys no more. Like, just give up. You know, you want to beat them, and you, <laughs> yeah, you give up. Yeah, you give up, man. But that's yeah. what college, that's a lot about college sports, man. I, I love the rivalries, man. I don't like lopsided rivalries. I love the, you know, like we talked about earlier, Texas and Oklahoma, man. I remember growing up watching them games, man, you know. Like, oh, man, Texas, Oklahoma playing, USC playing Notre Dame. Notre Dame wins or on a last minute kickoff a kickoff return or vice versa, man. You know, it's that's what makes sports, man. You Although know, I that's can what, that's what sports is all. I, I could say that in the NFL I have two favorite teams. It's the Dallas Cowboys and whoever's playing the Houston Texans. <laughs> well, why do you hate the Texans so bad, man? What, what <laughs> I mean they they just came in the league not too long ago. Like, you know, they they still babies, man. Like, I, I don't know what I, – like I told you, I grew up outside of Houston. But my favorite part of Houston is when I see it in the rearview mirror. <laughs> I, oh, I don't know what it is, man. I was an Oilers fan. Don't get me wrong. I was an Oilers fan. And you have to be a real fan to say you're an Oilers fan. Of course, my Cowboys yeah. always came first, so. Well, that well, who's the owner of the um that moved into Memphis? Was it um Bud, Bud Adams? Adam, Bud Adams? Yeah, that's a cuss word in Houston. You don't say that word then. It's they had a great franchise in Houston, and to me, Houston was up there with historical franchises: Dallas, the, the original Cleveland Browns, the Pittsburgh Steelers, even the Philadelphia Eagles, but. Washington Redskins, you don't take those teams from those cities. You don't do that. Nope. You don't do no. it. I, when they moved out I of think, Houston, I, it hurt my feelings, man. That hurt my feelings. I remember watching Earl Campbell, you know, play on um, the Steelers. That was a great rivalry with the Steelers back in the 70s. The Astrodome. I mean, it's you don't – you don't take that away, and, and that's why I wish the NFL would implement a rule. You can own this team, but you can't take this team away from this city. Wow. Like, you don't, you shouldn't be able to do that. Like, I think it's, it's like McDonald's franchise. You buy into the franchise, you own that McDonald's, but you decide to leave or retire, you can't take that McDonald's 
you can't take it. You just retire from it. And I don't think you should do that. I um I, I lost a lot of respect for Bud Adams. I lost I lost a lot of respect for the late great uh what's his name? Um he took the Cleveland team and moved to Baltimore. Um I can't oh, yeah, his name. Um uh, I, uh, I can't remember his name either. But. Yeah, and, and you and and after that the Cleveland like to me the, was it Art? Baltimore Ravens Art Art Modell. Art Modell, that's his name. But, but even right now, I still see the Baltimore Ravens as the Cleveland Browns. Like that's really who they are. True. True. You know, I I'm, I, I, I gotta tell you the I don't story. Think that's right. I gotta tell you the story. This is about how I, I met Earl Campbell. I'm walking through Sears and I got my oldest son with me, and he was just a baby at the time. And um, I'm pushing him along in the stroller, and he starts fussing. I can't get him to stop fussing. So this man comes up to me, and he goes, you know I, you know what's wrong with that boy? And I turn around, and it's, it's freaking Earl Campbell. He says, that boy is hungry. You need to go buy him some Earl Campbell sausage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's what's up. That's what's up. I forgot he he he's like he made millions off of that um the sausage he had that famous sausage yeah yeah oh yeah 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 this is this year's already been scary enough yeah it has it has been very scary very scary and then we <laughs> we still got Halloween coming yeah hell yeah <laughs> they gotta have Halloween because I I love candy so I take my daughter trick or treating every year and I I only take her so I can get some candy so I hope they still have trick or treat we can still have Halloween, you know. Yeah, that, you know, I'm 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 hoping that they do. Even if they don't, we're still gonna at least have a party or something and you know Yeah, I gotta go so, yeah, I gotta have me some candy somewhere. I'm gonna have some if I gotta go let's go buy a bunch of bag of candy from the store, you know, for my for my for my daughter and then for myself. I, I love I, I have sweet tooth. I love candy, man. I love it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I I liked it a little too much. That's why I'm diabetic, so I can't have the freaking candy. But you know, they don't stop me from sneaking a piece here or there. Well, yeah. Well, well, well you know, speaking of being a diabetic, you do know that. Um, I don't know if you know this, but um, drinking ginger water helps diabetics. I did not know it that. Helps. I learned that when I started drinking ginger juice. Um, I came across it one day and um. I drink ginger juice, ginger water. I'm sorry. I drink ginger water every day. And when I was doing my research about it, I, I came across that it helps people. With, uh, it, helps, it helps diabetics. It helps them. Yeah. So I'll something you can look into, list. man. I'll yeah. put that on the on the grocery uh, list. Yeah. Um, ginger water. Um, you can make it. Um, it's real simple. Um, you just boil some water. Get you some gin. Get you a ginger root from the store. Put about five, anywhere from five to ten slices in there. Depends on what you want. Once it starts boiling, you put it in. You can put it in from 10 to 20 minutes. You take it off. You drain it um, into a cup or whatever. Let it cool off. Come back, and you drink the ginger water, and it's good. And if you want to, you can also eat the ginger root like I do. It's spicy, but, you know, but it's healthy. It also helps with prostrate, too, so real good. You know, yeah. ginger cookies, are they were my favorite. I love ginger yeah. snaps. and. There's a lot of yeah. people say it's too spicy, but I love it. Of course, I like spicy stuff anyway. Yeah. Yeah, it's good for you. Yeah, um, ginger's good for your health. Well, there's a lot of health benefits with it. And uh, one of the benefits, if someone is a diabetic, it really helps them. It, it helps It helps the um, – um, I forgot the word about a diabetic, but it, it helps them with that, though. It really helps. So. Yeah, was it the uh, – the, 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 uh, I can't think of the term now. Yeah, I want to say glucose, age. but I might. Yeah, I want to say well, glucose, but I'm. I'm not. I'm not. It might. It might be that, but it, it yeah. helps. Well, it helps with your count. It helps with your diabetic counts. That's what it yeah. helps. It helps with your count. The glucose um, is it, it. It's your blood sugar. Glucose. Yeah, it helps with that. Yeah, it helps with that, and it helps with your count. So, and I drink it every. Although I'm not a diabetic, I drink it um, every day. Um, it also helps with weight loss. I will admit, I had a gut that was coming. Even though I work out, I was getting a gut, and um, I guess we're drinking beer. <laughs> and my gut has went down. Um, it fills you up. You're not as hungry as much. There's a lot of benefits to go with it, you know. Because I, even though I, I do drink alcohol, I, I tend to try to eat healthy and I, um, I exercise. 
And I, you know, I like to, you know, I drink cucumber juice, I drink ginger, ginger water, things like that, that, that really, you know, helps, you know. Um, like I said, it, it helps you prostrate, you know, um, black men are known to get prostrate cancer at alarming rate. So um, I drink that, that, that helps with that. It helps with your sex life too. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm man. definitely putting that on the list then. Yeah. Well, check with your wife on that because she might feel differently. So just... <laughs> Well, you know, know it's, all, it's always up to them. They be like, you know, it's always up to them anyway. So, um, I want to check with her to make sure she's okay with that. I, I sent her an article that says that um, that men have a lesser chance of getting prostate cancer if they have sex at least twenty one times in a month. So, I saw that. I saw, saw that. that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I saw that, man. I read like, that, man. <laughs> baby, you're, you're just saving my life. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I saw. Yeah, I saw that, man. I need to. I need to tell my wife that. I, I probably get hit upside the head, so I, I don't know. Because so. I know that ain't gonna happen. Cause she'll turn around and say something like, "For three minutes, yeah, I'm sure I can do that." <laughs> Damn, you get to go three minutes. Jeez, what are you drinking? Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 48, so yeah, you know, but that's something she would say. I'm telling you, that's something she was saying. I know she, she likes to be a little comedian sometimes, and she would say something like that. But you know, Doctor Oz said this that if a couple has sex four times a week or more, it it extends their their lifespan. You know, it's like an exercise. It really helps them. You know. Oh, that maybe that's what it is. She's trying to kill me off. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, after after. I was not having it for a long time. That's what it feels like. I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> hey, you that's know, what it feels like. So I, I gotta check and see if she's gotten life insurance on me yet or not. Yeah, check it because they they I'm gonna tell you the women are slick now. They they know they probably done the research. You know they probably figured out well if I don't give them this much and this uh, this might hurt his heart rate and I got this policy. Yeah, that's how I'm gonna do it. So you gotta watch them. You gotta watch them. <laughs> you know, they smarter than us. They, all they do is think. That's all women do is think all day. They they think all day long. Like that's all they do is think. They just think of stuff you never know, thought. Like where do you get that from? Then women they create scenarios in their head and get mad. And you they walk around the house, man. Like what you mad at? Nothing. But they mad because it's some scenario that they either created in their head or they dreamt about. And they could, a woman could go to sleep at night and dream that you cheated on and be mad at you because of the dream. Oh yeah, my, well, something my... you said in the dream. My my first wife was like that. She would wake up and she'd be all pissed off at me. And I'm like, I, I know we went to bed okay. I'm like, what happened? She said, I had this dream last night. You were off talking to some other girl. And I'm like, well, that was in the dream. Well, you still pissed me off. And so she wouldn't talk to me yeah. the day. But Here's the favorite one. They're hungry, right? They're hungry. So when you and I are hungry, we, we go get something to eat, right? We just go get something to eat. They get hungry and get mad at you because you don't know they're hungry. Mm hmm Oh, yeah. Oh, I'd get in trouble for things I had no idea what I was in trouble for. I, I don't get it. I'm like, why are you mad? Well, I'm hungry. Okay, go some eat. Well, you should have knew about it. How would I know you're hungry? <laughs> well, if you notice I wasn't talking, I had my hands like this. I, I, I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> You know, this one is another good one. Is my first wife used to get pissed off at me because a girl would walk across the, the screen on the television in a bikini or something. I'm like, so oh, hell, I didn't write the damn show. <laughs> well, you watched it. Oh, I'm supposed to watch the show like this? I mean, come on. Oh, my goodness. Well. Wow. I have to say, my the wife I have now, she doesn't do that kind of stuff to me. So I got a good one now. But, right, man, right, right. Man, that first. Mine one. too. Yeah, mine. She, she's good. I, I joke with her a lot, but yeah, that's how they, you know. They, but they get mad about the smallest things that we don't even recognize. We like, what are you talking about? You know, I had no idea, idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's the the perils of being a man. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I've been married too. Yeah, it's, it's the pearl set. You're right about that. Yeah, you're right. I got a story for days about being married, man. It's, yeah, it's got a story for days. <laughs> that's, that's why my wife don't like coming to my shows because she don't know what I say. You know, 
he has no idea what I say, man. So I things just pop up in my head about being married, and that's why I don't like coming to your shows. You just to say anything, you know. So like, like one day, she made a statement. She was joking. She said, "I should have married somebody like six ten. You know, I should marry somebody real tall, or whatever the case may be." And I said, "Listen here." If I was 6'10", I would be coming off the bench for the Lakers, not married to your crazy ass. But, you know, I, I said I said that at a show, and she was there, and she said, oh, my God, they're going to believe that. I said, they're not going to believe that. They know I'm joking. Come on. You know. And then, like, now this was true. She woke up one day and said, oh, my God, I had a dream that you bought me a car. I said, you better take your ass back to sleep and drive. <laughs> 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 I've got to remember that. You just gave me some new ammo. Oh, I'm going to end up sleeping yeah. on the couch for sure. <laughs> yeah. You're going to give me a drink. Yeah, man. Yeah. So, you know, I got I got plenty of, you know, some of them I make up like there's one. Um, And this wasn't true, but I just made it up one day at the show. I said, um, you know, me and my wife were getting freaky one night. And. She said, choke me, daddy. And I said, in the joke, I said, well, this is how the joke go. I said, yeah, me and my wife were getting freaky one night. And my wife said, choke me, daddy. And then I got to go to court on the third, you know. <laughs> <I choked her>. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's just stuff like that, man. You know, I just, just different things come. I got jokes of days when come to her, man. I, I just, plenty of jokes, man, Um, you know. You know, when you get married, you don't have sex like you used to. You know, it's just all types of jokes I have, man. Just oh, yeah. Married, you know, oh, you know kids, you know, got jokes about the kids, man. Um, one of my favorites, man, is um, my, my son Chandler. And, um, you know, me and him go back and forth all the time. Right. So one day, um, he asked to drive my car. I said, man, you can't drive my car, you know. I got somewhere to go. So he gets mad. He called me. He said, he said, that's why you ain't got no hairline. I said, okay, no problem. So the next day, I saw him kiss his mom. I said, come here. He said, what you want? I said, I saw you kiss your mom in the face. He said, yeah, I sure did. I said, she ate my ass last night. Mr. Ass Face. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's, that's just a joke I've had. Yeah, that's just a joke. <laughs> um, yeah. I, you know, there's nothing but, but, you know, there's, there's nothing greater than making your kids uncomfortable. Because um Oh yeah. When when um oh, yeah. my, my wife now we got married um about four years ago. And um anyway, we moved in together and the kids always asking, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? So I'm going to get them to stop. You watch. So I started, yeah. we started going off to the bedroom to get ready to go to the store. And they'd say, oh, where are you going? I said, I'm going to defile your mother. And they'd quit asking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I like that. I like that. You know what, man? I'm surprised you don't do stand up, man. Cause you, you, you're a funny dude. You, you say a lot of funny stuff. You got the, the spirit of a comedian. You know, you got that happy go lucky spirit of a comedian. And your jokes, man. You know, they spot on. You know what I mean? Hey, surprised you know, you're not a stand up. Surprised you're, you're not one. When you're born with a face like this, you have to be funny, or you don't get nobody's attention. <laughs> Right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, my wife will say something to me, you know, like, why did you do this? Why did you do that? And I, I get her back. I say, well, you're the dumbass that married me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man, you know too funny. Is. You know how it is. Yeah. You got to, yeah. when you're married, you have to have a sense of humor. Yeah, you do. Got to have one. That's the only way you can live. I mean, other I mean, than that. I mean, hell, she did. She married me. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> oh, man. Too funny, man. This is a oh, funny show. <laughs> so, Real funny show. What else you got going on, man? Um, well, you know, um, I'm also uh, 
I'm a co-host for the Liquor House Comedy Radio Show. Right, right. Every Wednesday night, um, we go live on Facebook. We, I mean, we actually a uh, radio station, but I go live on Facebook, do like a watch party every um, Wednesday um, okay. from seven to eight. Um, we we all so Facebook friends now, right? Uh, yeah, yes, yes sir. tonight. So I make sure I tag you. I make sure I, um, I tag you. Or if you forget, just just come to my page. Um, I I go. I go live at seven seven p.m. Eastern time, so okay. it'd be six o'clock your time. Six yeah. um, so, so I yeah, got to so, decide. Um, I got to decide which comedy show to watch tonight, either yours or the uh, the uh, vice president's of debate. <laughs> well, you know what? <laughs> There's might well. I don't know. I don't know if this debate will be as funny as the one from last week. If it is. Definitely tune into that because I ain't gonna lie to you, man. Last week had me dying laughing, bro. I, <laughs> I, I was just thinking of all types of stuff to say, man. When I, when I saw it, it's you know, um, it was just it was sad but comical too at the same time, you know. So I, me being a comedian, I took I looked at it the comedy side more of anything, you know. Um, and I told somebody this. I said, man, I believe Trump was a comedian in a form of life because some of the shit he does and says, I swear, it's just comical, man. It's I know he's being authentic, but it's just comical at the same time. I'm like, this dude don't give a shit what he says and what he does. So, um, and then I was looking at Joe Biden. I, I was thinking about him. I said, you know what? Joe looks like that sleepy uncle that needs to get tucked in the bed. And I said, he's going to mess around and um, say, instead of saying 2020, he's going to say 1972 or something <laughs> like that. I mean, just jokes are just. And then I said, you know, and I said, with Trump, I said, he might. He might just don't give a damn and say anywhere with a hard R, man. And these are the things that were coming through my, my mind because I was just looking at it from a comical point of view, man. It was just it was just funny because I was like, wow, man, this is really funny. Like, America really just don't give a shit now. You know, they got these two people up here and Trump don't care and Joe trying to say it was just it was just funny. I mean, in well, some ways it was sad, but by me being a comedian, I just took the I took the funny out of it. I looked at the funny part. Oh. And I was just I was just sitting there just thinking of stuff to sound like, yeah, you know what? I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna say that, you know, um, whatever the case may be, man. You know, and, and that's what I was telling you earlier about comedy just being real and, and funny at the same time, man. You know, like um I, I have just so much funny stuff was coming to my mind, man. I was drinking too while I was watching so <laughs> I was really I was really like, oh my god. Yeah, I just I just Jokes just coming in my head. I was just thinking all types of stuff to say, man. You know, um, like I, I had a joke. I said, you know, I said, you know, Trump is gangster, and and where this joke really goes like this. I said, Trump got wait five kids, three different baby mamas, government assistance, living in a government house, and five ones. And I said, if that ain't gangster living in the damn hood, I don't know what the fuck is. <laughs> Like, and I, and then I, I said, you know, the only thing I said, the only thing I don't like that Trump said was when he was running for president. He said, you know, you you grab the the p, mm -hmm. the coochie, and I said, no, Trump, you don't grab the coochie. You eat the coochie like a bowl of cereal, or something. <laughs> some some crazy joke I said like that, you know. Well, so like, you know, you know that, and I. And, that's how I deal with that stuff because I, I, I try to find the comical part in it. And, you know, I had some more stuff about Joe Biden, you know, um, you know, being because someone said, yeah, Joe Biden is real consistent. And I said, yeah, he's as consistent as someone with um, Parkinson's disease and a coloring book. So, you know, um, <laughs> but, you know, I have got to remember that one. Hey, you know, if you're Irish. Yeah, man. If you're Irish just, and, and you don't you know, vote for Joe Biden, then you're not magically delicious. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, and you know, my last name is Irish. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. I'm having too much fun, man. You, you bring me, you bring it up my cat. I feel like I'm on stage now, man. You, you bring it out now, man. You make, you make me feel like I'm on stage, man. I got an audience in front of me. So you're gonna have to yeah, do man. a live with us sometime, then. Yeah, man, I I like to come and have a good time, man. I, I just when it comes to politics, I I like to I like to joke more about it. And at times I'm serious with the joke, but I 
I just like the I look at the candidates like when Hillary ran. I I should talk about Hillary. I said you know, um, I I said I had a joke where I said I trust a, a Bill Cosby drink before I trust Hillary Clinton. Her lying ass, you know. It's nobody's <laughs> off limits when it comes to politics. I don't care who you are, you know. You know, I remember the, the the biggest debate we had was jelly beans or peanuts when it gets <laughs> you know? I miss yeah. Them. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, so I just I just like to be able to joke about everything. You know, I, I had jokes about Obama. I said, shit, Obama the first black president, but damn, why my credit score still low? Shit, dude, come on, man. <laughs> like, you supposed to have the, like, the, the Family Care Act for black people and raise our credit score and shit. Like, come on, man. Like, what, what happened? So, you know, man, <laughs> that's how I... I I approach politics too, you know, you can say something funny and, and have some truth to it, you know, but yeah. I just like to have fun with it. You know, I ain't there to, I'm not there to uh, um, make people mad or let's have a riot, you know, no, let's just have fun. It is what it is. I mean, how can you not laugh at those two candidates last week? How can you not look at the candidate spirit in any presidential race and not laugh at something they do or say? I mean, come on, that's, you know, that's what it's all about, you know? That's true. Hell, I laugh at myself. I I, I got jokes about myself, man, like my hairline. You know, I, I'm i growing my hair back now. But when I shaved it, when I was bald, I shaved this way I shaved my hair. I said my hairline went far back in segregation, so I had to shave it. Shit, you know. <laughs> you know, my, you know um, my hairline went to the to the store to get a pack of cigarettes like a black father never came back. So, you know, you know, I talk about stuff like that. You know, I talk about myself, you know. And that's the beauty of comedy. You can talk about yourself. You can talk about politics. You can talk about your wife, your kids. You know, you can talk about how dumb you are when you got caught for stealing shit. You know, you just just have fun with it, man. That's what comedy is all about. It's truth and funny at the same time. It's how you take it. That's you right. Know? That's right. It's how, you know, did you come to a show to be mad? You know, I got jokes about black people coming to the show. You know, black people are the only group race of people that would come to a comedy show not to laugh. <laughs> It, it, yeah, we gotta find like, out what's wrong like, with everything, right? Yeah, like I'm, I'm, hey, I'm gonna pay you. I'll pay all this money to come to your show. You better make me laugh. <laughs> Why would you pay the money to come to the show and you're unsure if you're gonna laugh? That's like buying soap and saying I'm unsure if I'm gonna take a shower. Like, what the fuck? You know, like, come <laughs> on, man. You know, like, <laughs> no, for real. Like, seriously, like black people will come to a show not to laugh. They they will come to find you not to be funny. Like, I'm gonna pay this money. To come to the show to see you not make me laugh. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know. So yeah, man. That's what I'm saying, man. You I just find humor in everything people do. Everything. I don't care what it is, you know. Um Well, you know when, anything, if, everything. When when a white person goes to see a black comedian, he's gotta look around the room to make sure it's okay to laugh. <laughs> well, you know, I've, like I told you before, man, I, I, I'll say the N-word on, on stage, right? Is it okay? Is it going to laugh? So, so I, tell, I, tell, I tell the white people, I say, look, I'm going to say the N-word. I'm going to say, this is, a, this is my disclosure statement. I'm going to say the N-word. And dear white people, you can laugh. You can laugh and come right along with the black folks. You ain't got to look around to see if it's okay. Just laugh, you know. It's okay. I'm going to say some black jokes. I'm going to say some white jokes. You can laugh at that. Some stuff that you might sign true. Just, you know, just laugh. Have a good time. You can laugh. You know, and I love I love it when I know you got Christians in the audience, you know. Whether they live by the Christian faith or not, they go to church every Sunday. And I always like to talk about the difference between black churches and white churches, you know. Like, for example, black church, black people go to church on Sunday. They don't get out to the following month. That's how long they stay in church. <laughs> like, literally. Yeah. Go, you, go to, you go to a church, or you go to a black church, they will hold you hostage for 36 hours. That's just how they operate. Go to a white church, you get in at 10, 50, go in at 10 o'clock, you're out at 10, 20. Y'all see one song, <laughs> one verse. If you're at a Catholic church, you say, Hail Mary, you out. And they go to a black funeral, that's just as long. I'm telling you, man. I, yeah, man. I told the pastor one day, I, he said, man, when you coming back to church? I said, when you get out early, that's when I come back. <laughs> I said, if you go to church there, man, I stayed in church so long, my wife had a baby, man. I'm like, come on, man. What's up? Damn. 
No. White people, they pass the collection plate around. I don't even know if they pass the collection plate around in white churches. Black churches have, they pass the collection plate around at least 15 times. I counted one day. <laughs> yeah, um, we, we still do it once. Yeah, I'll do it once, you know. But y'all don't, y'all don't have 15 building funds. They're building this, they're building that. <laughs> the, the program in the black church looks... I mean, the, the the flyer got like 99 things before the professor even get up there and preach. I mean, it's I'm like this. Just come in, why can't we just come to church, sing one song, and let the pastor preach? I don't know, I like going to white churches. I'm telling you, go to white churches, everybody happy. Black churches even celebrate, they mad. Like, how you at church celebrating God, you still mad. The white churches, man, they get the good talk playing, they running around screaming. Man, you come out of the white churches happy. And you feel like your credit score done went up. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man. Somebody wants to adopt you. It's like, yes, we like this black family, man. I like going to white churches, man. I'm, maybe there's some hope. That's why I'll be glad when this COVID is over with, man. So I can attach myself to a white family and my credit score will magically go up. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't believe white folks got bad credit. I don't. I don't think y'all got bad credit. I think y'all do get it. It'll last long. <laughs> somebody go in there and fix the shit. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody, why they be like, wait a minute. Um, um, Cal, um, Cal Yates, your credit score is a 200. Well, let me do something. Let me just take my pen out. We're going to change it right here. <laughs> you have a 700. <laughs> Black people, man, we got to. We got to go through a long process to get our credit fixed. <laughs> so I'm saying, because I'm saying to myself, somebody in this church can change my credit score just by writing it down somewhere. <laughs> I know they can do it. I know they can take a pen and just write it. <laughs> Ain't that how it works? <laughs> Christian Brothers, um, you know, I know they got some good moonshine down there in Austin now. Come on now. I get jacked up on the Mountain Dew. I get jacked up on the Mountain Dew. You know, he makes come on. I get jacked up on the Mountain Dew. But I'm going to say this before we get ready to close. You know who made the best moonshine? Who's that? Rednecks. Yeah, I have to agree to that. They make the best moonshine. But they re these are the ones who make the real, the best moonshine. The ones with one, one brown tooth and that brown tongue. <laughs> then you got to hear dueling banjos in the background. That's right. And <laughs> the 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 worst the worst off they are with drugs, the better the moonshine. I'm telling you, there's no lie. I'm telling you. I'm amen. telling you. I, I, amen. I've been I've been to some of the trailer parks, and I, this is no lie. I went in I went in one trailer park, and the lady was over there. Literally sniffing crystal meth off a dead daddy's tooth, and that was the best moonshine I ever had. I swear to God. <laughs> Thanks for joining us here on Listen to the Vibes and tune in again for some more great guests. And thank you for your support. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you're listening to us on any of your favorite podcast platforms, please be sure to leave. A nice comment if you enjoyed it and if you didn't well i didn't say you did anyway but until next time thank you we hope you enjoyed this episode of listen to the vibes you can catch us on buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and on youtube follow us on facebook at the vibes broadcast network and on instagram at the vibes broadcast